The AI revolution is rewriting the rules of cybersecurity. The financial stakes are massive. Morgan Stanley projects the AI-based cybersecurity market will skyrocket from $15 billion in 2021 to a staggering $135 billion by the end of the decade. But this isn't just about market growth. It's a high-stakes arms race. As cybersecurity giants like Palo Alto Networks deploy AI defenses, cybercriminals are equally quick to weaponize advanced technology for increasingly sophisticated attacks. So which cybersecurity trends are poised to take off in 2025, and how will they fundamentally reshape the business landscape? On this episode of Growth Stories, we're joined by Wendy Whitmore, Chief Security Intelligence Officer at Palo Alto Networks, to discuss the critical cybersecurity themes investors need to know. Wendy, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me today. Excited to be here, Alexis. Well, there's a lot to talk about when it comes to cybersecurity. And, you know, looking back, what were some of the key themes in 2024? And how do you anticipate that will carry over into 2025? So 2024 was a pretty busy year in the cyber threat landscape and the cyber world in particular. And I think 2025 is probably going to shape up to be even more so. Uh, It's a very dynamic environment right now, and we're not just talking because of technology tools that attackers are using, but now you have a geopolitical landscape shifting, you have changes in investments and adaptations to national security that are occurring, all of which is creating a pretty dynamic environment. So going back to 2024, I would say what we saw predominantly was disruption. And what I mean is intentional disruption with a specific cause from cyber actors to attack environments where they knew, hey, if we can take systems offline in a way that brings pain to a consumer and an end user that feels that level of pain, we're going to be more likely to be successful in commanding some sort of return on payment. So 86% of the cases we saw in 2024, and those are cases um, well over a thousand that the Unit 42 team investigates, uh, 86% of those included a specific business disruption that meant an organization maybe couldn't do things like serve patients or process payroll um, or pay their vendors and all of which takes a lot of time to recover, gets a lot of attention oftentimes from the media and from consumers, and then draws certain actions. And so what I think, you know, if we look at that in the you know landscape of 2024, if we shift that into 2025, what we're seeing now is moving, um, not only having cyber criminals who are interested in doing that type of activity, but now nation state actors who are looking to embed themselves within corporate systems, corporate environments, as well as critical infrastructure for the potential that they may need to leverage that access at some point in the future. So that concerns me greatly because operational disruption of a consumer environment is different than operational disruption of a water plant or an electric facility and a power provider. And so those are some of the bigger concerns that we have. And were there any surprises that stood out to you, or I guess, uh, what is the thing that's keeping you up at night as you look at the landscape? Um, You know, I think it wouldn't be a cybersecurity conversation if we didn't cover AI. Certainly that's keeping us up at night in terms of anticipating how much faster are attackers going to be able to, uh, you know, to move and maneuver throughout environments, but also on the positive side, how can we leverage that to our benefit from a defense side? And I think that's an area that certainly Palo Alto Networks has made a lot of investments in, but we are seeing that from defenders. Um, If you're not investing in AI and being able to fight attacks with AI, then you're going to be left behind. And so that is, I think, a positive uh, area that we maybe didn't anticipate as much, right? There's always concern when there's a new technology out there that the offense, in this case, the attackers, are going to be able to leverage it more successfully than the defenders. And I think by and large, while we have seen many investments from attackers, um, and you know maturation of their uh, ability to socially engineer you know organizations to leverage communications both written and verbal to um, bypass help desk protocols to be able to you know assume identities of other people we have seen that 
But we've also seen so many organizations invest in AI to where they're taking uh, what used to be weeks uh, to respond and what we would call the mean time to respond or this average time for organizations to respond to a threat from weeks down to days and hours. I think that's an area that we're going to see much more growth in terms of shortening those timeframes moving forward. And you talked about the importance of investment in this area. And I'm just curious to see if you've noticed any trends in terms of corporate spend on cybersecurity initiatives. You know, there's a lot of economic uncertainty out there. Uh, I think a lot of people are being asked to do more with less, but uh, anything you're seeing in that area? Well, I think also on a positive note. So one of the things we've seen historically trend-wise is organizations waiting to work with firms like ours after they've had a breach right? And looking to investigate it after it's a major problem. Now what we're seeing is so many more organizations shifting left and being able to say, hey, we're going to invest proactively, whether that's in assuring that our uh, SOC matures and the processes and procedures that we're using are much more efficient. Certainly the onset of AI has a lot of organizations asking questions about how they can protect their own environments, making sure that you know they're concerned about information, inadvertently leaving their organization, maybe an employee is entering data that they shouldn't into an open model. And so that's raised a lot of concerns and questions in a positive uh, lens, right? Taking that towards, hey, CISOs and the C-suite are saying, hey, we need to invest in this to make sure that our organizations are as secure as they can be. And that will have downstream effects of making their overall security programs also more secure. And uh, we know the importance of AI and, and the growth of AI applications in enterprise, but how will the evolution of AI, uh, you know, increasingly becoming autonomous, uh, giving uh, this technology decision-making abilities, uh, how does that impact cybersecurity? Well, ideally, it's in a very positive way, right, uh, in terms of the impact. So what we're really looking at, and I, I think you're certainly referring as well to some of the um, recent advancements in agentic AI. And I think, again, organizations that are not investing in those capabilities to build out their security operations centers, to build their detection capabilities and processes, they're going to be left behind. So the good news in particular is that because AI is advancing at such a rapid rate, we're starting to see that it's taking over more of the uh, processes which used to be more repetitive and it's no secret that there is a cybersecurity skills shortage. So what that means as an employer and as a leader in an environment is now we can take some of those more manual tasks that used to be manual that were repetitive and allow those, um, you know, the AI and machines to be able to deliver that work and then leave the more interesting, thought provoking, deeper, uh, meaningful tasks to the humans. Um, which is something that makes employees happier at their jobs. It makes them more interested They in the work. They feel like they're having a true impact. And it means we're solving more advanced problems for our clients worldwide. And that's something that I see as a net positive. So with more organizations adopting artificial intelligence technologies, what is Palo Alto focused on to minimize the vulnerabilities here? We believe organizations will need to continue to secure their usage of AI and on April 28th, we announced our intent to acquire Protect AI, which will help us do that moving forward. How has the cybersecurity landscape shifted outside of agentic AI? And what can business leaders expect when it comes to the threat landscape in 2025? Well, I think all of the advancements in technology are resulting in greater speed uh, by the attacker. So these timeframes of where you used to have an attacker get into an environment, compromise systems, and then start stealing data that could take days. And in some cases, weeks, that's now taking hours and at most days. One of the bigger concerns I have though, in combination with that is just the scale. And I think AI in particular fuels uh, an easier ability for attackers to scale, meaning, so examples of, you know, what do I mean by that? Um, when we look at vulnerabilities in environments, you see attackers, and it could be cyber criminals and nation states all at the same time, scanning in mass. So tens of thousands, in some cases, hundreds of thousands of systems that could be scanned in a matter of hours to identify where are their vulnerable machines and applications that can be then exploited. And that has a lot of downstream impact because if you're a nation state actor, you might 
get access to those systems and lay in wait for some sort of later time when you need to leverage that capability. If you're a cyber criminal, uh, you may decide, hey, these are systems I'm going to encrypt or delete or destroy after I've uh, you know, stolen the sensitive data uh, off of them so that I can command some form of payment after. And that's resulting in a lot of concern for just the collective defense moving forward. And when we look at uh, the types of attacks uh, that we see, uh, you know, viewers of this might remember um, last year, some of the big cyber security attacks revolved around uh, United Health and AT&T. Uh, those are very high profile data breaches. Um, were there any lessons learned from that? And, and how are business leaders looking to approach uh, addressing these vulnerabilities in 2025? Great question. So I think one of the most prevalent areas where we've had a lot of learning from executives in particular, and I don't mean just the uh, chief information security officer, but the CEO and the board are really realizing something we cybersecurity practitioners have been saying for a while, which is that cybersecurity really is a team sport. And we used to frame that in the communication of if you're the CISO, you need to have a great working relationship with the CFO and the legal counsel and the board of directors. And now you need not only that, but your organization needs to really have great working relationships with your vendors, with your partners, with law enforcement, with regulators. It is a comprehensive effort. And so one of the areas where I think we've seen the greatest growth is that cybersecurity leaders and practitioners are uh, bringing that uh, mission and that cultural influence to the rest of the business where people are realizing it's everybody's collective job to be able to you know take cybersecurity seriously that if there is a problem in their team or their part of the organization that they know how to communicate that to the right people so that it can be if it's a problem it can be stopped as quickly as possible and that they can bring the right people into those discussions so when we're looking at proactively you know practicing uh, for to be able to defend against these attacks, that's something that we're increasingly seeing these business leaders bring as all of their peers to the table. And Wendy, it's not only seems to be a team effort, but when we look at having just sound cybersecurity, um, it seems like it's becoming a, a competitive differentiator, at least at a competitive advantage. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? I, I think that's a great point, Alexis, because the reality is that um, you know, especially like, let's just take one example in it, a nation state actor who's maybe looking to collect information to conduct corporate espionage or to steal intellectual property theft. Um, oftentimes they are going to move to another environment that's less difficult to penetrate and to get in to collect information. And so I think that's an area that certainly organizations and financial services and the defense sector have known that for a long time, but you're now starting to see organizations in more broad sectors uh, be able to leverage that and understand the importance as well. And you've mentioned the rise of nation states in this equation, and we've seen a lot of attacks from Russia and Chinese hackers. Um, how much of a threat are we seeing from those specific countries? And can you talk a little bit just how the rising geopolitical tensions are maybe uh, changing some of the calculus here when it comes to cybersecurity issues? Well, I would say I've been investigating these types of attacks for over 20 years uh, and primarily nation state actors during that time frame. And we've never seen nation states operate at the scale and the breadth that they're operating today. So that's a staggering statistic and certainly a concern. The geopolitical environment, I think it's no secret that countries uh, are leveraging cyber as part of the battlefield. So whether that might be uh, looking to take out a power supply in advance of a physical attack um, or potentially more from an information and disinformation uh, capacity, there are so many different ways that cybersecurity is critical to that. So critical to physical military actions. So I think moving forward, we're going to continue to see nation state actors get uh, more refined at their techniques. We're also seeing a blending uh, and emerging of nation state and cyber criminal actors. And if you think about it, if you're a nation state actor that can kind of leverage some tool kits, for example, software toolkits that are already available out there that are known to be from a cyber criminal actor, it's great plausible deniability. It's less investment that your organization needs to make in developing new tools. And so it makes sense as to why they would be doing that. 
but we're also seeing nation states who are leveraging cyber uh, attacks as a way of economic gain. And North Korea is one of those in particular where it's multifaceted. They are uh, not only looking to conduct ransomware attacks in order to bring the payment back in uh, you know, to their country, but then they're also looking to create these fraudulent workplace uh, scams where they have employees in mass, this has become very sophisticated, applying at technology organizations and all kinds of uh, companies throughout the US and abroad um, to bring those paychecks home, but then also um, to build these uh, personas and networks on LinkedIn to attract employees of legitimate corporations to apply for jobs that look great and look very interesting and great skill sets. But then when they go to apply for those roles, they actually end up downloading malware um, and many times to their corporate systems. So you have this real blending and merging of these worlds now. And I think we're going to see a lot more of that. Well, Wendy, thank you so much for your insights today. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Alexis.